Oh, um, Broncos country. What is going on, everybody? Hope you're having an absolutely wonderful day. First off, I want to say thank you so much. Hit the 1,000 subscriber mark. Thank you guys so much. That means the world to me. More content coming to you. And what better way to celebrate and to kick off this next part of David Talks Broncos than having a very important guest on here. This is Cameron Parker. You probably know him on Twitter or from mainly Broncos. But uh, Cameron, thank you so much for joining. Uh, a couple questions. How are you doing? And, and tell us a little bit about yourself if, uh, if any of our viewers aren't familiar with you. Uh, I'm doing well. Uh, I'm recovering uh, from a week-long trip uh, over uh, in the mountains. So the family and I took a really, really nice vacation. Uh, Enjoy, uh, enjoyably say that I have witnessed all three Super Bowls. Um, and so I, I've been a Broncos fan my entire life. And uh, it really wasn't until college where just the, the, the radio stuff and yeah. getting in, in front of a microphone and everything where, you know, it's just like, you know, I, I feel really comfortable about doing this. And obviously sports brings a lot of people, you know, together and, um, and I know we're in the midst of possibly a political season, but the one thing we know is sports brings a lot of people together. And, and, and that is the most beautiful part. I mean, you know, unless you disagree on the NCAA 25 trailer, that's certainly, you know, a conversation <laughs> for another day, but, uh, but, you know, uh, but all in all, um, you know, really, it, it really wasn't, you know, until I was in front of a microphone where, you know, I, growing up as a shy kid, it just, I, I just started deviating away from my, my shyness and it really got me uh, comfortable talking about sports and talking about, you know, different sports that I love. Right. And so, uh, and one of the biggest things that I gravitated so much to was Broncos. And so uh, on, uh, you know, on uh, campus at Metro, um, I have actually uh, Anthony Rodriguez to think about, I uh, think uh, for this, because, you know, he was, the person I reached out to at Metro and he was the first person that got me out and, you know, got me the platform over on KMET radio. And we did a show together called the KMET sports show, which was just a, an amalgamation, a mixture of all these different sports. Um, and then after that, um, did a show called, um, the NFL stampede where we would do obviously Broncos related stuff, but we'd focus, you know, solely on the NFL. And then, you know, from there, obviously, uh, the NFL stampede became the Cameron Parker show. And then that's actually, uh, this is, a you know, a nice little humble moment too, because the yeah. Cameron Parker show became a very long stead, you know, long couple years as far as a podcast, uh, over on the, uh, over on Spreaker, or, you know, sometimes I would broadcast, you know, and every once in a while, mm -hmm. well, the Cameron Parker show ended up becoming mainly Broncos and mainly Broncos, um, you know, is just something that obviously it, it's in the name kudos to Maddie for actually creating the name of mainly. Um, and anybody that wants to find it over on any platform for media, I should probably clarify for this, you, for, for, for this, for you. It is not M A I N L Y. It is like a horse's mane. It is uh, M A N E L Y um, Broncos, but a really clever, uh, way that we, uh, we were able to uh, nail that down and yeah and then uh, built that up uh, basically from the ground up if you will and then it was a couple of years or a year we uh, we signed on with Mile High Sports because um, they were doing a podcast format down there um, really started to get our uh, popularity going and everything and then one thing just kind of led to another and the way we do our formats if anybody's been listening to our past audio formats and everything it just got to the point where it was just like, you know what? I just wonder if streaming is better because, yeah. you know, so much of us, you know, when, you know, you're doing recording and everything, 
it kind of uh, flip a switch and you turn on your radio voice in the sense of like, see, now the reason why we're laughing so hard is because so-and-so has this big massive screen in the back. So like, it's, so enough of that. That's when we just realized, you know what? Uh, we'll just go down and uh, actually enjoy this and actually do some streaming. So we, we, t- we, we were talking around and I was already mm-hmm. a part of the MHRT network and 5280 at the time. And so it just seemed like at that point, maybe an easy transition to the MHRT network. And then one thing led to another, and I'm now a part of the 5280 podcast still, and I am uh, still doing uh, the mainly Broncos podcast. So a long run around, but it just, it goes to show you that if you pursue, you know, your dreams and you, you pursue your a dream of being on the air and, and everything, it, it's, it's a long grueling process, but uh, you know, you, you can get there with a lot of hard work. It's well worth it, and I, guys, I'll link all the shows in the description here to make sure that you go subscribe. And with 5280 and Mainly Broncos, uh, what are the times that you're usually on streaming for anybody that wants to catch the live? Um, we only do it once a week. Uh, well, I guess for, for my sake, I do it two times a week, right? <laughs> uh, but uh, Tuesdays, it is at 6 o'clock Mountain Time, 8 o'clock Eastern, uh, seven o'clock central and obviously um, five o'clock uh, for uh, those Californians down over there on the Western coast. Yeah, of those former Raider fans. That's yeah. how I like to, to think that's about it, I, but and let's then, go. Uh, oh, oh, go ahead. Say, and I was going to say mainly is seven 30 okay. on Wednesdays um, at uh, um, seven 30 in the evening, I should say, and obviously nine 30 Eastern eight 30 central and then uh, six 30 yeah. uh, over in the Pacific time. So, great podcast and i gotta give you props cameron because especially last year last couple of years i mean i feel like you have been one of the main voices of reason within this fan base when things right. have not things have not gone according to plan you know with certain moves certain hires that we've had uh over the years but now i i don't know how you feel i feel like there's a there's a new level or it's a different feeling style of hope uh, with with what we have now, Sean Payton's going into his second year. We have a new potential franchise quarterback. Let's go ahead and uh, just talk about Bo Nix. What were your initial thoughts on him as a Broncos target, fit for the offense? And then when when he selected, uh, what what did you think about this whole process and with him eventually now landing here in Denver? I'm a big Star Wars fan. I'll just uh, preface this this way. I'm a big Star Wars fan, and, and I, I really feel like with the hiring of Sean Payton, the the hiring of the ownership, and you know, unfortunately, uh, you know, Sh- uh, Sean inherited a situation with uh, with Russell Wilson, and I think that as much as we all wanted it to work out, I'm a big Russell Wilson fan. As much as I wanted it to work out, it didn't. And, you know, because at the end of the day, obviously, uh, you know, contract is certainly a, a money driven situation. Right. But but we certainly have to look at it through the lens of this wasn't Sean Payne's guy. And the Broncos decided uh, to make the bold decision and move on from Russ. And and uh, at the end of the day, it really was just a stylistic change. I mean, it, it was just a change in. Uh, in who Russ is as a quarterback and who Sean Payton really wanted as a quarterback. And I give Russ a lot of credit because obviously he has been praising, you know, Drew Brees and, and working with him and using him, you know, I, I at least commend him for that. But the unfortunate thing is they're just different quarterbacks and yes. they're very different quarterbacks. And so unfortunately it didn't work out. The Broncos moved on. Now, why do I say Star Wars? Because you bring it to this year, there is now a new hope into the Broncos <laughs> galaxy uh, with uh, with this Bo Nix draft selection. And um, it, uh, it it is definitely brought, a I think, a new hope uh, to a lot of Bronco fans. I think there's probably still a portion of Bronco fans that are somewhat puzzled with the idea of uh, a Bo Nix. Maybe not so much Bo Nix, but the idea of taking him in 12 and we, we'll, yeah. we'll certainly talk about that in a little bit but um 
but I, I just I think that it's 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 been revi- um, invigorating to the fan base. Yeah. You know, finally Sean Payton or the team itself they've got their draft quarterback, and frankly, their first first round draft pick, if you will, at quarterback since that dreaded name Paxton Lynch, and and uh, you know, and it's just it, it's exciting because now this is someone that Sean can groom. He can mold into the quarterback that we want to see and more importantly the offense that we want to see going forward so um and but again like we'll, we'll talk about the bonex particulars here in just a little bit but no i just think that it's an exciting time because you know we finally have a quarterback that i feel like he's got a head on his shoulders he's incredibly intelligent i know you're you're a buffs fan so watching a lot of pac-12 stuff you've probably been through the ringer a little bit at times and maybe watching a little bit of some bonex tape and some bonex games and everything but i just he he seems very he's a gamer he's a he's highly intelligent he's a cerebral processor in the pocket he does a lot of things pre-snap Everything that you would describe as a Sean Payton quarterback is exactly Bo Nix. Well put. Well put. And I think it's been funny for a lot of us fans. I, I, I can't remember what your opinion on him was maybe six or seven months ago, but I know myself, there's a one of my first videos on here where I come on and say, Anybody but Bo Nix. That's just kind of how <laughs> I feel. And uh, Cecil Lammy was one of the first guys that I just remember really pounding the table for Bo Nix, for Sean Payton. And um, that kind of got me to to look at him a little bit more closely with an open mind. And like, like you said, he's he fits and has uh, the qualities that Sean Payton's looking for uh, in a quarterback. And I think one of the puzzling things, I'm curious to hear your opinion on this question but as the draft process went by or went went on there wasn't to me there wasn't really any glaring holes within his game uh maybe he doesn't have the josh allen arm uh but i to me it it just didn't make sense how he was constantly listed as like the Mm -hmm. fifth sixth seventh best quarterback in this class when i really feel like the only couple things that people would argue uh, against him would just be his age, which again, uh, some other quarterbacks are coming in a little bit older as well. Michael Penix goes eight at roughly the same age. Uh, that wasn't a concern for Joe Burrow a few years ago. And uh, the, the fact that he threw uh, screens, which uh, again, if you've been a Broncos fan <laughs> watching this team over the years, you know that hitting a check down or hitting a screen on time is uh, is very difficult to do so i didn't really see that as like a negative thing but I, i'm yeah. curious like uh how you felt about him during the draft process and maybe why you feel like in my opinion uh he was overlooked when really uh, in the nfl you're just it, when you're making first round draft picks you want to make sure you're not missing on a guy and i feel like he has all the qualities to where you you're at least going to get a nice baseline hopefully with with how he plays you know, um, I, I just found it so interesting, you know, when you're watching tape and you're watching, I should say, breakdowns uh, from various different people, uh, a lot of the analysts, and you, you you touched on a lot of the analysts were a mixed bag. I mean, a lot of them were mixed in the sense of, okay, Bo Nix is quarterback three or, you know, Bo Nix is... Um, you know, quarterback two or quarterback seven or, or you know, all, all across the board, like, or, or Spencer Rattler, you know, above yeah. Bo Nix. Like, I mean, just goes to show you just how across the board it was. Um, but what I found so interesting, and this goes back to the fit with Sean Payton. If you go back and you listen to a lot of the breakdowns, and at least from what I've been able to find, a lot of the former players, keep in mind, a lot of the former players who played in the National Football League, quarterbacks um, or just players, always talked about the fit of Bo Nix and the Denver Broncos, and particularly with Sean Payton. So that has always stuck out with me in the sense of this really, at the end of the day, wasn't so much about listening to the analysts, which is you know, a big thing for me. And this was a bit of a change in a sense, because I always like to listen to analysts like Cecil Lammy or, yeah. and, 
you know, in, in orange and blue today with AJ Mason or, you know, or listening to, you know, the guys over on KOA and they, they yeah. produce, they do great stuff. Like, you know, I love Ryan Edwards and you know, he and I go way, he way back and everything. And all have been all right and everything. We, we go way, you know, way back and stuff. So I enjoy their content and everything, mm-hmm. but it was just interesting to me that the one consistent that you were seeing in so much bone eggs content mm-hmm. was that Kurt Warner, he is such a great fit with with Bonex, Chris Sims. Granted, Chris Sims didn't have an illustrious career, no. um, but and and he's been known to have some flamboyant takes for sure. But still, yeah. he came out and he said the most perfect fit was Sean uh, was Sean Payton is Bonex. And actually, the Sims family goes deep on that. So if you go into the um, Believe Network. Uh, Phil Sims and his other um, brother, Matt Sims, I think, yes. uh, uh, d- did a show and they talked again about how, for Phil Sims, about how big of a fit Bo Nix would be for Sean Payton and um, and Chase Daniel. Chase Daniel being another one, uh, as far as uh, one that was really hyping up the idea about him, you know, with Sean Payton. And then, of course, the one who has called so many college football games and a CU alum and maybe one of the brightest young, uh, I want, I shouldn't say young, but one of the brightest announcers yeah. and minds in college football right now, Joe Klatt has been pumping the drum maybe since day one. He may have been the first yes. person that really, you know, pounded the table for Bo Nix and in, in Denver. And then, and that's Joe Klatt. So I just think at the end of the day, and when I was specifically looking at it and really molding my own opinion, look, I could care less if he was quarterback six because the the more the more things were starting to come out. Like obviously, they didn't have enough draft capital. They didn't have enough, right? Um, you know, anything like that. But just because someone else's quarterback six does not mean he's Sean Payton. Uh, Sean Payton's quarterback sit uh, quarterback six which we clearly had evidence of we clearly had evidence of that just by that pick alone and then just by when you read even after that him talk about him and just lo- just gush over him day after day after day mm-hmm. and and so much so that even gush about the idea of pairing him with another player on his team in a very un you know in a very unique and bizarre way to pair a wide receiver with him again you know so it's just i just in a very um way and the way that he went about it and the way that bo nix even carries himself it was just it just seemed like the more things were coming out that it was funny enough it was a garrett bowles type of year where you just you got the feeling where it was bo nix all along you really felt like it was bo nix all along and even Peyton kind of talked a little bit about that uh, about that in the presser when they drafted Bose, but he was a bit frustrated with all the stuff that was leaking out, uh, you know, to the media. Uh, you know, with Bo, he was like, he was you could tell he was so frustrated by the fact that, you know, the media the media was starting to kind of get a hold about you know Bo Nix and everything, and but I think what made it, you know, um, I will say what maybe made it a little bit more of a antsy thing was of course you know the fact about the michael uh, Penix thing to atlanta because they probably wanted to have a little bit of some flexibility you know to trade back and and go and get Bo, and then you know maybe make a little bit more moves if they could but uh but i mean we're also talking about a head coach who missed out on patrick mahomes right and and i get i've gotten criticized by this you know, on social media every once in a while about like, well, are we sure that this really happened? It's like, dude, Sean Payne's talked about it. Adam Schefter's talked about it. Like numerous, you know, report, even a, a guy who's very close to Sean Payton has talked about this in terms of Jeff Duncan. He's talked about this, um, about how he really wanted Patrick Mahomes and the chiefs went out and sniped it in front of him and took Mahomes in front of him. So I think, you know, to the panic stuff gave him a homes uh, PTSD to a degree. And it was just like, you, you, you have to take the quarterback there. And and if there's one thing that we know in the course of in the NFL or even college football, and we recently just did a college football podcast, obviously about yep. Nebraska and CU on your other pod, David talks buffs. And 
and how important it possibly was for Nebraska and with Dylan Riola, it's like you, you land on a quarterback, your rebuild, your foundational piece could start from there. And the moment your, your quarterback hits the ground running is the moment the wheels really start to churn. The pistons really start to fire, you know, for how good your team can be. No doubt. And I think what's been one of the most refreshing things, Cameron, I've almost forgot how this like feels like as a fan, like drafting a quarterback high and like having the head coach actually be 100% on Smart. board. Uh, yeah. <laughs> because, yeah, we just, th- there hasn't been that organizational continuity to where they've been on the same page and they've agreed on on these guys that they've brought in whether it's been drew lock or paxton lynch um, you know always changing offensive coordinators too never helps these guys and it's so refreshing to see at otas i mean sean payton says not to read into it but it's like come on you gotta read between the lines he wouldn't be he would if this was Paxton Lynch or a Paxton Lynch type player. Sean Payton would make sure he was not running with the ones when the media is available to come. Yeah, you know, to take a look at what's going on. I think again, <sighs> he's saying the right things. Sean Payton isn't the guy that I feel like normally glazes all over his guys. <laughs> um, you know, he's no. he's somebody that uh, you have to earn that right. But it seems like he is very committed excited about Bo Nix that's why again I don't like you said I don't think that he was the sixth quarterback on you know that's been reported that he was number three but a fantastic fit I think the fact that it's been reported Sean McVay and the Rams wanted to pick Bo Nix if he Mm -hmm. fell to them at 19 I think it was 18 19 or 20 uh, that speaks again highly another bright offensive mind one of the best in the NFL was also in on Bo Nix which I found was interesting my question to you Cameron is if you're Sean Payton, uh, we've seen a little bit about how he's been mm-hmm. integrating Bo Nix into this quarterback room. Is he the starter week one? How do you ramp him up? How would you prepare him? Man, um, you don't want to put your expectations too high. Um, I mean, I'm already dealing with this, you know, being a Nebraska fan with Dylan Raiola, <laughs> but like, um, <clears throat> But like a, you, you really don't want to put your expectations too high because you you don't want to be disappointed. And we as Bronco fans have been plenty disappointed in the last eight to nine years post Peyton Manning. Um, but you know, again, you still have to read. It's that famous like you really have to read the room. Like you really have to read the room. And um. Bo Nix just screams week one starter right now. I mean, if you really had to call it like it is, you know, do your uh, imitation of Babe Ruth, you know, point to the sky and call your shot. I would say it's, it's Bo Nix, no doubt, because I mean, you know, it's just the, the nature of the room. Yeah, they do have uh, Jarrett Stidham. Um, and I've been on record as saying, you know, at least right now, I, I feel like Zach Wilson won't be on their roster uh, week one, but I don't think it would hurt to have a, you know, three quarterbacks, yeah. you know, on your roster come week one by any stretch of them. If, if you were to ask Agreed. my, if you were to ask my preference, I would rather have three quarterbacks yes. be on that roster come week one, just based on stability's sake. And of course, you know, with you even having a rookie quarterback, that's a conversation piece for another day. But, um, but he just, it goes back to everything that Bo Nix has emulated as a prospect coming into this league and why it's so puzzling for people that felt like he was QB six, because if the, what the way you kind of look at the quarterbacks that were taken. Yeah. I mean, we, you use uh, the word potential a lot with these quarterbacks and you do, you use the word potential a lot with these quarterbacks, but every once in a while we do throw that very famous term around and as pro ready. Yeah, if you're actually looking at the quarterbacks. I actually mean, I'm not trying to say this as bias, but if you're looking at it from all the quarterbacks that are really taken in the first round, David, who really is the most pro ready quarterback of that bunch? Uh, it it's it's Bo Nix, and yeah. I mean, people can say we're biased and everything, and, and which is fine, but like 
if you break it down, Caleb Williams, yeah, he was taking number one, but there's still a lot of flaws to his game, probably, yes. in the sense that um, could translate. And but he he's electric. There's a reason why he went number one. Right. Um, and you know, Jaden Daniels, he's electric. The Anthony Richardson syndrome. Um, you know, if you will, I don't think they're the same type of prospect to a degree, but like there's a lot of stuff to his game in the sense that makes you so fun to be drooling over. Um, yes. Drake may same thing. Um, but Drake may falls and in, falls into the prospect category. Yes. And, you know, in the sense of like, let's groom him and to, to call like it is, you're getting the same reports right now at the OTAs as we were with drew Locke and Paxton Lynch, not saying that, yeah. you know, not, not saying that may is going to end up being those things, but like, it's harsh criticism from the Patriots from, from Mayo is like, he's just not ready yet, you know? Yeah. And um, it's just, it, you got to face it. It is what it is. Now the Minnesota Viking situation is interesting because they did bring in him because they, they did bring in Sam Darnold and they did um, draft JJ McCarthy. Now the reason why I might kind of lump both of them together in terms of maybe Bo Nix and, and JJ is, is because of this ceiling idea and because of the fact that McCarthy was with Michigan. So if you're really man to make it a true conversation piece for me about who really is maybe the most pro ready, it might be maybe Nick's and McCarthy. But yeah. I think at the end of the day though, it's just um, Nick's is the most pro ready of all the bunch. I mean, if you really look at it, I know I kind of built a house there, but, uh, but Nick's is, he really feels like that kind of guy who, um, who, who can win a lot of guys over with his leadership. And um, if they're in look, I, I, I know it smells and it tastes like sunshine and rainbows on the grit and glory, you know, documentary that's come out and everything, but you do get a side of him. You do get a side of him. Um, that is just nothing but leader. And, and and oozes leadership. And when you've been faced with adversity in the early part of your career and going to the school that you've wanted to play for your entire life and it never panned out, then you go to Oregon, whose head coach is actually uh, a Nick Saban disciple and you win him over. That's enough for me in a sense. And, and Oh, by the way, he wins in the holiday bowl against North Carolina and yeah against drake may like it's just more boils down you do really wonder if um you do really wonder about bonex i mean the expectations are um certainly need to be tampered um and and even him for even for him starting week one but yeah for sure i i there's no doubt in my mind he's week one starter and i think this will be the last thing i say kind of on the draft process regarding bonex but it's been a while. I don't know, Cameron, if you can name anybody else off the top of your head when it comes to how they've been talked about like this outside of Bo Nix. But I found it very puzzling to where there were so many people that have had an opinion on Bo Nix to where they say, well, I didn't like his tape three, four years ago. And I can't, like, I can't think of any other prospect that's come in um, – to memory where I feel like a lot of people had their opinion on them formed three, four, five years ago. And they, they can't shake that. They can't shake that. And I always thought that that was pretty odd uh, with, with Bo Nix, where I think, again, a lot of people who watch a lot of sec, they're just like, I'll never, I'll never see Bo Nix, uh, yeah. you know, outside of what he did at Auburn. What, what did you think about all that? Cause that, that was kind of an interesting <sighs> enigma. I feel like regarding him, you know, um, to a certain degree, I, you know, it's interesting because, and it's actually occurred to me a few times. And I don't know if I said this on mainly or 5280 before it may have been mainly, but when you really look at it, there are three quarterbacks, three, uh, who have roughly had kind of the same story, like in the sense of oh they got better at their next at their at their last school. Um, and I'm not talking about Caleb Williams. Okay, I'm not talking about Caleb Williams. Um, 
But uh, Bo Nix, he was a very high-level recruit, high-level recruit, five-star dual-threat quarterback coming out of high school, really wanted to play uh, play at Auburn, play for his dad's school. And uh, funny, I actually – I just realized this when I th- think back to that documentary. He beat Oregon in a comeback victory. Right. He beat Oregon in a comeback victory, and then, uh, and then is the the, the quarterback for Oregon. Um, but uh, you know, so you saw some flashes. But I and I think that one of the best. Now I, I don't think he's this comparison, but I think the best comparisons that I saw for people that were making this is you saw him be Jay Cutler with Auburn. And Alex Smith with Oregon, and I don't, I, I don't think he's, um, he's in any shape or form Alex Smith by any stretch of the imagination. I, I you know, um, but like he was the fact that he really grew um, in his intelligence and just as a player, and understanding that you don't have to. It's like, it's like a really good golfer, you know. Don't lose sight of the fact that you had a crappy first shot. You've got two, three, four more shots to go um, where you can actually right a lot of that wrong that was your first shot. And I think that Bo Nix um, really realized that, you know what, that this mistake, I can right that wrong this very next play or this very next drive. I can do – like I don't, and I also don't have to rely on just myself. I have a team. I, I have a team. I have a team that I can rely on. I have a coach that I can fully trust in. And I think that once he finally got all that, once he finally got all that, you really got a chance to see the full picture, the full outlook of possibly what Bo Nix could be. Mm-hmm. And therein lies the puzzling nature, of course, with Bo as a prospect. The other, uh, um, the others, of course, you know, a very high level recruit coming out of high school commits to Oklahoma, Spencer Rattler. Uh, Spencer Rattler. I mean, uh, uh, you know, and to a lesser degree as a prospect, you know, he goes and he transfers over to South Carolina and he, uh, I'm trying not to invade a lot of Husker stuff into your podcast. I'm not trying personally not to do it. It's okay. We got a lot of Huskers, a part of Broncos country, (laughs) but you know, he goes and he, he, he gets indoctrinated, uh, with Satterfield, Marcus Satterfield is the offensive coordinator. And um, if anybody uh, knows a little bit about Marcus Satterfield, he is very in depth on in huddle offense, like as far as working in huddle uh, with offenses. And I feel like that probably helped him a lot in terms of his development coming from Oklahoma. You know, Lincoln Riley, he's not so much about the, you know, the, the in huddle, if you will. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's more about the traits and let's see what you can work with. And then let's go win some ball games necessarily. Um, but Rattler, I think to a much lesser degree, you saw him grow. You yes. saw him grow as a player and as a, as specifically as a person. And yes. um, that's the other side of it with Bo Nix at times. And I'd love the comparison with Rattler and Nix because the comparison of, well, I don't like what they did for three to four years ago. Well, Rattler, people, there was the report that came out on draft. He was like, oh, they they hated what he did in high school on the next Netflix. It's like back when I was 18 or 19, I was making really bad decisions also. So it's just like, you know, people grow up, people mature when they get older and they, you know, they face adversity. Look at Bo Nix, as I just said, Rattler goes to South Carolina and he performs. So, and, and Michael Penix is, um, I think is a much weirder case in that Indiana was not, um, not really a household name by any means. They were kind of slept on in the big 10. They were slept on in the big 10. Um, and they would have a few good games, uh, against Ohio state and Michigan and, you know, some of that. So they would have a few good games, um, and Penix was kind of lost in the sauce a little bit where, and, um, and, but where you really saw him grow was with Kalen DeBoer, the offensive coordinator um, for one year with Indiana, um, really kind of get a chance to see where it takes off. Then DeBoer takes off. He leaves for Washington as the head coach. Then Penix follows him. And you really got a chance to see how much of a, 
stride he really was taking. And actually, this is where I think it gets also funny as a draft prospect because Penix and Knicks, I felt like were being ripped apart for something that was similar to them because in terms of the offense that they run, the the screens, the short passes, and it's like, well, it's not the same necessarily the offense that Knicks is running, but like the passes that Washington had, the wide receivers that they had, that's not a they that's not a knock on on Penix. It's just they about three how, wide receivers drafted. They had three wide receivers drafted, three very good wide receivers, one obviously in the top ten. And so, like, it's about maximizing the talent level at your disposal. And granted, there, there's parts of the, of the game with Penix that definitely turned you off. And Penix has the higher ceiling in terms of the, you know, of the, of between he and Knicks. But, you know, it's the injury history. That's really the thing that really turned you off and turned myself off, I should say, with, um, with, with, with Penix. But, but I just think it's so interesting when you look at the landscape of, you know, it's all about where you grow as a player, where you yeah. grow as a player. And with Bo, if you're consistently growing as a player and you're growing as a prospect, you are only helping your stock. And frankly, for Penix, I know he was taking eight, but it is what it is. He was taking eight. Like we, and, and because of the way he played, so much of what we saw was growth from a lot of these quarterbacks. And there's a reason why a lot of people were pumping the drum of six quarterbacks taken in the top 13. And what happened? Six quarterbacks were taken in the top 13. An unprecedented thing happened because of the fact that we have a quarterback class where in a lot of years, three, four, five of those quarterbacks are probably going to be taken one and two respectively. Do you think, because now you got me thinking, Cameron, do you think that there will ever – we'll kind of see a reverse trend happen because you're talking about these guys uh, going to their second school and having that growth, finding that success. Again, you mentioned Penix. A lot of people forget that he was at Indiana for like four years. A lot of people forget about Spencer Rattler. I didn't even watch his Oklahoma tape this year during the draft season. Um, I, I didn't even watch it. Um, but – now I'm also thinking of guys like Jalen Hurts, uh, guys who transferred, uh, had success, but then you know fell into the like mid second round. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I I wonder if, and comparing it to again the guys for the most part, let's take Caleb Williams out of it. Jaden Daniels say, would be another one actually. Yes, Jaden Daniels, absolutely. I was blanking on him coming from ASU. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's not like that. His games at ASU looked all that great, um, which was uh funny, but I think that guys like JJ McCarthy, I always thought it was kind of interesting because I'm like, aren't you just kind of hoping that he becomes the player that Bo Nix is right now? Um, which I always thought was kind of funny, uh, but uh, maybe it's the age factor and they feel like there's this, yeah. you know, greater ceiling with some of those guys. But I, I think we're seeing now uh, a trend in the NFL happen with uh, these, these older rookie quarterbacks, as long as they're continuing to show that they're growing every year, they do find themselves to have some level of success. And I think it bodes well. I don't want to do too much of a tangent on this, but I think the real heart of the topic falls in line with the transfer portal. And I think that Bo Nix and Penix, Bo Nix probably is specifically, but um, but I feel like Penix, uh, Rattler, Daniels, um, and Nix, I think are going to end up being case studies for the transfer portal. Because... Uh, you know, we're talking about a very rare case where quarterbacks, you know, went six in the top 12 or, you know, yeah, top 12. And um, it's it's an anomaly. And, and people have made a huge deal about the transfer portal, and especially in the case of player development and, um, and getting better at your next school. That's why it's going to be really interesting to see what happens with Dylan Gabriel. Not to say that it's Oregon, yeah. but it's but it's going to be really interesting to see what happens with Dylan Gabriel, of course, Dante Moore, who transferred from UCLA to Oregon. Yeah. Um, 
So it's really going to be interesting to see how many, should I say, you know, elite quarterbacks in college football, maybe not necessarily prospects, but elite college quarterbacks do the same thing. And, you know, maybe, and this is, it's opening up a huge Pandora's box on the transfer portal, but just knowing the fact that quarterbacks are maybe not so much looking at the idea of developing maybe with one school, but just looking at the pro prospects and sort of treating the transfer portal like a free agency, but just treating it like, okay, this is the right fit for me. Mm -hmm. How can I develop? Will this, can they take my game to the very next level? There's some pros and cons with it, of course, but Mm -hmm. Um, but I really feel like Bonex is specifically is going to probably end up being a case study for it in terms of the transfer portal. Um, so I don't mean to, I don't, I don't yeah. mean to open up a, a Pandora's box on it, but it's just like, I think the heart of the debate and the heart of the discussion kind of leads itself there. Totally. Be, um, because I feel like, you know, it, it's such a, it's such a dichotomy right now in, in college football mm-hmm. with how things have been transpiring and, mm-hmm. and everything. And so, um, but I, I'm fascinated to see by, uh, by, you know, how it all, you know, works out and everything. Cause I, um, I, I, I do think the transfer portal has a lot of good. Yes. There's some bad, of course, mm-hmm. you know, um, cause I, it's like people, there's a reason why people call it NFL for agency, if you will, in college. So, yeah. but no, I, I just think that for Bo Nix's case, we're talking about a guy who, left a very bad situation or not a very bad situation, but a bad situation went to a very, very good situation developed as a player and specifically as a person as well, even more and became a top, you know, a a top, um, a top 12 pick. And it's just, it's, it's crazy. It's absolutely crazy. Now, transitioning we'll we'll take a few minutes uh to talk about this and then we got to get together for another show because there's a lot of different topics that i want to uh hear your take on cameron but uh looking at this year uh, more weapons coming in through this draft class we've signed a few in free agency uh such as like a josh reynolds or we have uh, lucas kroll who a lot of us uh, are are hearing a lot of hype about we saw some good in the, in the small amount of snaps he had last year how does this Cortland sutton stuff get settled uh how do you see it turning out if you were in control how would you handle this whole thing oh man um i've started to kind of say this more and more and i don't know if you've been tuning into some of the shows lately on 5280 and and mainly but i'm kind of Uh, saying this on the show and maybe we're kind of reading a little bit too much into the idea of they want to run the football, you know, and be what they were last year. Should I say like in terms of, um, I know they want to run the football in terms of like, you know, you know, be like and and help out their young quarterback and Bo Nix. But I think, when you have the weapons that they have right now, which is, yeah, it's a very weird room because you do have proven talent, but you also have the unproven talent, you know, with guys like uh, Devon Vele and Troy Franklin and, um, you know, and, and then you go to the, and Marvin Mims, of course, in terms of, you know, unproven, if you will, very high ceiling. Um, And then you go to Cortland Sutton, you go to Josh Reynolds who are proven there's no doubt that they are proven Mm -hmm. um you need you want to see more from them but i think maybe we're looking at it a bit wrong in the sense of the offense that actually especially when you hear some of the rumblings from some of the writers and the the analysts about the sean payton offense being back i think maybe we're looking into it a bit much in the sense that i think you're looking at an offense that is going to be predicated on spurring the ball around to 10 different wide receivers and, you know, meticulously moving the football down the field and creating a lot of plays in the open field for Josh Reynolds, Cortland Sutton, Marvin Mims, you know, obviously Troy Franklin. They want to create a lot of opportunities for every single person on their roster. And I think that's one of the most beautiful things about Sean Payton is that now that he has a quarterback or quarterbacks that he's handpicked, um, in his room, he can run an offense that is uh, going to be 
really um, well operated for their skill set in in particular for the other players around them for their skill set. And I think that so maybe we're looking at it wrong in the sense of um, what we saw last year because all the offense was predicated around Russ and then running backs getting so many, you know, targets and, you know, screw it. Cortland Sutton is down there somewhere, <laughs> you know, like th- those types of, I think, uh, plays which were very one-dimensional. I think at times you're going to see a Broncos offense this year it's going to hit its wall for sure cuz you know if Nick's is starting he's going to be hitting a rookie stride probably the mm-hmm. CJ Stroud stuff is an anomaly don't expect it um but uh and I I think you're looking at probably an offense David that is maybe a little bit different than maybe what people were expecting sounds like it would be a little bit more fun to watch, don't you? Don't you? Yeah, think? Just a little bit, just a little bit. As long as they, you know, they put up twenty-four points up on the board and it results in you know maybe double-digit wins, but you know, let's not get ahead of ourselves. <laughs> Man, that that would be fantastic. But it, yeah, it's when you frame it like that, it really does get me excited to see things maybe a little bit more wide open. Again, uh, when you put it like that, again, it makes sense if. If we were really having to shorten down the playbook and the play calls, and uh, you know we couldn't rely on uh, to or to run plays in certain parts of the field uh, just because there wasn't that vision or uh, ability to read those concepts there. Now, what I'm hoping for and what you're alluding to is that we got a quarterback that should be able eventually to take on the whole playbook and. Uh, that, that means no part of the field can be left unguarded. Uh, I think he's got enough arm strength to make those throws and really just want to hopefully continue to see his anticipation, his mind. If, if there's anything that Peyton Manning taught uh, me in that 2015 thing uh, yeah. season where he's got no feeling in his hands and you know he's <laughs> th- throwing ducks half the time, man, his mind was still as sharp as ever and it got us in the right play. And he got that offense to be effective enough uh, to help support that defense to win that Super Bowl. And I think that regardless of the tools, this offense under this coach needs somebody with a bright mind uh, that can see the game how Sean Payton sees it. Yeah. Um, And if there's one thing that – Probably Peyton Manning said to himself, but if there's one thing that Bonex needs to say to himself is, I am one with the force and the force is with me. You know, like, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> but nice little callback, uh, you know, to be, you know, talk about Star Wars at the very beginning. But uh, yeah, yeah. It, it's a great way to kind of bring things full circle. Cameron, yeah. super appreciative of you joining me. We only got to two of the things we had on the agenda, but this was perfect. Oh, that's cool. We'll have to uh, connect right. again. Uh, soon again really appreciate it y'all please be sure to go subscribe to all of cameron's uh, social media on x i'll link his account his podcast his channels as well Um, anything in particular that uh, we should have the viewers keeping their eyes out for i'm actually uh going through topics you know when you're in the dry season you're you're yeah. kind of scratching and clawing for <laughs> topics. So uh, so I think next week we're going to, uh, on, on mainly we're going to talk about who are some of the indispensable players in the position groups. Um, so like, uh, yeah, possibly like who are the indispensable players um, that are maybe in the position groups, if any. Um, we certainly, there's one that certainly rolls off the tongue rather easily. Um, you know, but, uh, yes, we'll, we'll, we'll certainly talk about that and make sure you guys again, uh, follow that Twitter handle, um, at mainly Broncos for that. Um, and, uh, my Twitter handle is actually in the name right there at camera Parker PO. Um, but yeah, this is, this was a blast, man. And I, I, I love talking Broncos and truth be told, uh, now that I'm back from my trip, this is the first podcast that I've actually done oh. being back from, uh, uh, from the trip. So, um, I feel honored. Well, thank you so much, Cameron. Again, it really means a lot guys. Thank you so much for tuning in, smash that like and subscribe to everything. Y'all know how it is. Let me know your thoughts in the comments. Uh, I will be back again shortly as always and go Broncos. All right.